Good evening. Welcome to the Parish Primary School Consultation Meeting for St. George's. My name is Davida Morris. I am your moderator this evening. And um, we, tonight we are looking forward to having a robust discussion on the Parish Primary School Consultation. So before we get into the main presentation, I am going to open the floor to the Minister of Education, the Honorable Diallo Rabain, JP MP. Minister. Oh, it looks like the minister is having a bit of technical difficulty. Just give us one moment, please. Ah, okay. All right. Ah, uh, the joys of live TV. I, the minister is having difficulty logging in. So I'm going to pause for a moment and see if we can fix this very quickly. Um, while we are waiting for the minister to log on, what I will do is go over some of the, um, the ground rules for the um, presentation. Um, so first, the purpose of this meeting. Um, sorry. So the main purpose of this meeting is to present the proposal of the parish primary school to you, the Bermuda public. Um, we want you to have a full understanding of what it is that the government envisions and why. So we have this pr proposal. We hope that you've um, taken time to, um, to read the document because it's full of very useful information. Like we are here to answer your questions, but definitely the document has a lot of very good information for you. Um, we're also here to listen and respond to your questions because we know you have concerns about the proposal and we want to address all of these concerns because we want you to feel comfortable with the, with the proposal that we've put forward. And again, um, we want to, we definitely want that feedback from you. So there will be two presentations made over the course of this meeting. And after each presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions, make comments. Um, the Ministry of Education truly needs and wants, your fee wants feedback from you, the Bermuda Bermudian public. So I hope, like I said, I hope you've read the consultation document and have your questions ready. Um, Within the Ministry of Education, we they know that the Bermudian public may have suggestions um, for the ministry. So yes, we definitely want to obtain your feedback, your suggestions and alternatives before a decision is made. This is a true consultation process. So know that no decision has been made as yet. We need your feedback in order to make a final decision. So ground rules for the evening. For those who are on Zoom, please, we ask that you keep your camera on at all times. This is to help identify persons who may have questions and distinguish you from ministry personnel. Um, also, we ask that you display your full name. Um, this actually is very helpful to me if I need to call on you if you have a question or comment um, that I may address you correctly. Um, third, please place your comments in the chat. Um, if at any time during the presentation you have a question you want asked, just please put it in the chat. You can find the chat by moving your cursor to the bottom of the screen and a toolbar will come up um, that has the sound and video options. And in that same line, you should see a box that says chat. A box will appear and you can type your question in there. I will be able to get that and ask that for you. Um, for those who are at home, you can submit your questions using either our interactive presentation tool, Menti, at 
www.menti.com. Um, there should be a code on the screen that will that you can use to um, utilize and make sure that you get your questions in. And if you are watching on CITV, you can also call um, in on 478-3301. The phone lines will be open from about 6.30. Um, so if you have questions, yes, please do give us a call. Um, so what you can expect this evening, like I said, there will be a, there's a two part to this, to this presentation. So the first part will be a presentation by the Commissioner of Education and other, um, and Dr. Simmons, who works within the Department of Education. And then there will be a pause where you get to ask questions because it's a lot of information and we want to make sure that nobody gets left behind. And if you have a question during the presentation, type it right away. Um, or if you are um, online, just write it, write it down, put it in the chat, Facebook. We will be collecting all of that information and we will make sure that your question is asked. Um, so after that question and answering session, we'll, um, we will have um, education officials on hand to answer, answer your questions. So we'll make sure that you get the correct <laughs> Um, and there will also be polls, um, a few polls during the um, during the, the course of the presentation, just to get an idea of how where people are at, um, what they're thinking, get a temperature of it. So um, I think one thing I did not say is to for those who are on Zoom to please mute your camera. Um, that's to make sure that's mute neutral video so that we can. Um, the presenter can be heard without distractions. We will definitely take your questions. Um, so if you raise your hand or put a question in the chat, we will most definitely um, acknowledge you and answer your questions. So I am hoping that those are essentially the ground rules and the expectations of the evening. I am very much hoping that, I'm not sure if the minister is on as yet. He was very much wanted to give everyone a greeting, um, just to welcome everybody to this process. Um, unfortunately, I've found out that the minister cannot get on. I'm sure we'll, help, we'll get him in later. So we will continue with our presentation and I will have, I want to now open the floor to the Commissioner of Education, Mrs. Kalmar Richards. Commissioner. Thank you, Ms. Morris and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the consultation meeting. We must improve education, public education for our students and we really do need you to join us in this effort because we all have a responsibility to make our schools better. We must do better for our children by redesigning the public education system so that no matter what school a child attends, he or she experiences success as a student and ultimately as an adult. We have developed a proposal for how we can make our primary schools better. And I will be sharing information with you tonight about the, in the proposal to introduce parish primary schools. If accepted, the proposal will require all of us to work together, to be prepared to make tough decisions and to make the much needed change based on what is best for all of our children. Legislation will be introduced to change our system from a three-tier to a two-tier system as part of education reform. That legislation will result in two years added to the primary level and one year at the senior level. We are excited about the fact that we will expand curriculum offerings to come on par with the curriculum offerings of the best schools around the world. And we will do that for our children. We know that teaching and learning are at the heart of education. And so we have spent significant time developing a very powerful and compelling vision for learning 
and we will share that with you this evening. That learning that we envision for our children moving forward will be personalized and it will be based on the gifts and the talents and the interests and the passions of our young people. We cannot achieve the vision for learning without renovating and refurbishing existing buildings. Our current buildings are not able to accommodate the increase in students and staff, the expanded curriculum offerings, and the type of teaching and learning experiences that our children need and deserve. We also will be proposing fewer primary schools, one per parish with two in Pembroke, and we want to do this to ensure equity and better utilization of resources. This evening, I will also share with you the concept of the parish primary school, what parents and the community, uh, surrounding community can do to help schools to become better. I will also share the factors that we considered to determine the 10 school locations which can be developed to achieve the vision for learning for our children. I'm so excited about what the proposed changes would bring for education uh, for our children and how these changes can have a positive impact on their future, but also future generations. Our children deserve the best that we can give to them. And we have to come together to make our schools the best for our children. So the first part of the presentation that I will uh, be sharing with you will focus on the reasons for change. Why are we changing? Uh, Dr. Simmons will then share the vision for learning with you, and we will also show you some possibilities for what uh, some of our learning spaces of the future will look like. I will share about the legislation that will improve the structure of the school system, drill down and talk about the parish primary school concept, and then end the presentation, this part, by sharing why we are proposing fewer primary schools. The question of why we need to transform is a question that is on the minds of many parents, many educators and individuals in the community. But we are very clear that we need to transform education for our students. They are the reason why we are looking to transform and to change what we are doing and improve what we are doing in education. We know and we believe that all of our children are capable, that they have tremendous talent, that they have gifts, and that they are quite able. But what we are seeing is that not all of our children are excelling. And we want a system where all of our children are excelling and where we tap into their gifts and their talents and their passions. We are well aware of the fact that our educators as well as our parents have stated that the services that are being provided for our children are either non-existent or the services that are in place are certainly not meeting the needs of children. They're not frequent enough. And so we recognize the need to improve services because they are inadequate. The programs and special programs that we have in place for our children are not meeting the needs of all of our children. Our parents will say, you've placed my child in a program, but the program really is not meeting my child's needs. We recognize that we're not meeting the needs of each and every child who is in our public school system. When we consider the academic performance of our students, overall, our results are not satisfactory. We are finding that there are pockets of children who are excelling, we want to shift and we want to put measures in place and we want to bring about change that will enable all of our children to exceed, uh, to excel. We want our children to be able to hold their own against their local peers and international peers as well. 
But right now, when we consider the academic results and we compare them uh, against their peers locally as well as internationally, our students are lagging behind. Our children really need to be prepared to compete locally and globally now and in the future. And we must change what we are doing within the heart of schools, the teaching and learning in order to make that happen. The, old, the buildings that we have are old buildings. And if you've read the document, you will see that our buildings, some of them have are in the, uh, been around for 90 plus years, if not more. And so when we consider the vision for learning moving forward, what we envision learning, teaching and learning will look like in the future for our children, the buildings that currently exist will not be able to accommodate that vision. In plan 2022, there is a significant statement that captures the sentiments of parents and the community. And that statement says that the parents and the community are demanding change, that they are demanding a transformed education system. And we are responding to those demands for change for a transformed system. The world has changed and we need to change with it in terms of what is taking place within our schools, in terms of our learning spaces, in terms of our curriculum, in terms of how we are assessing our children. And we are also aware that there are a notable number of individuals in the community who have a lack of confidence in public education. And we want to change that. So it is time for us to change and to transform the Bermuda public school system. Dr. Simmons will now share with you the vision, a very compelling and powerful vision for learning, along with uh, he will share also about some of the learning, potential learning spaces for our children and what they will look like uh, as we consider the vision for learning coming to life inside of schools moving forward. Dr. Simmons, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Mrs. Richards. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Mrs. Richards uh, indicated, this is about a change agency, and it will require uh, a new powerful vision for learning. And we are confident that what we have outlined, which reflects a lot of what the public uh, thus far whom we have engaged have put forward, uh, capture some of that. And by the chart that you are looking at, uh, when you look at the things, uh, some of the components or dimensions, whatever you want to call it, uh, in this chart, first and foremost, it's a personalized learning, and it is reflective of 21st century education uh, components for learning. We want it to be flexible. We want it to be adaptive for Bermuda's children, full of the inspiration and future focus. Most important, as uh, I'm sure there are teachers on board, uh, it has to be engaging, which implies that it must have the active learning that's a part of this here. You may see here also the importance of entrepreneurship. And as we get into some of the charts, we'll capture where that is played out. But I can assure you, this is going to be a curricula that is going to be called or a schooling experience, an education experience that is culturally relevant for our children. So as we look at the first slide and get into the outdoor classroom, the garden, and uh, this is just an indication of what an outdoor classroom can look like. We want our children to at least at minimum experience 40% of their time outside the classroom in a learning environment. We are a 21 square mile island. Our children, regardless of where their school is located, should have a learning experience that takes them across this island. And we should be uh, certainly equipping them and resourcing them with the necessary uh, transport that gets them up and down and across this island to experience an outside classroom that is not just outside their building, but maximizing the full complement of what Bermuda has to offer. 
So the outside classroom is it. As we go to the second slide and look at the multi-purpose classroom, at this primary school level, this is open. And this is uh, an engaging multi-purpose classroom where we get down on the level with the children. Parents are going to be invited and very much a part of this learning engaging environment in the multi-purpose classroom where, yeah, play, reading the books is very much a part of this shared learning uh, space. So it isn't just for children, it's for the teachers, it's for the adults, but it is designed that we get down on the level of children in a multi-purpose classroom. As we progress to the lower classroom in the next slide, this slide, this is where, again, uh, an interactive learning environment, cooperative learning is reflective and begins here. Inquiry models of teaching begins here at this level, in the lower primary level especially. And we want our children to begin to show and demonstrate and express what their interests are, their talents are. And we should be meeting their talents and uh, at least exposing them, exploring with them, you know, what their talents are and their interests are, yes, in this traditional or this non-traditional classroom. And so you see the furniture uh, as it is laid out there, certainly does not speak to what you currently see in our traditional classrooms today. In the next room, well, hey, 21st century learning is about creativity. And we certainly want our art rooms to reflect that, all of our rooms to reflect and express our children's creativity. But certainly in the art room, as you see some of the traditional illustrative arts reflected in this depiction, our children will also be exposed to the digital devices. The technology is a part of this here. Uh, the interactive uh, boards for teachers is a part of this room. Our children will get to understand how they can create some of the illustration that you see there in a very digital graphic way. As a matter of fact, we already have some of our students experiencing that in some of our schools, right? But this is something that all of our students, regardless of what their artistic talents are, they should all have the opportunity and the experience to express themselves in this uh, particular classroom. From this classroom, we go to what, what is called the amphitheater. And we want Bermuda's children to begin to demonstrate and perform. This is where they should be depicting in this next slide of the amphitheater, showing these same illustrations. They need to show and perform. This is the opportunity that uh, what you allow our children to produce in project-based learning project-based evaluation, it's demonstrative. And the amphitheater affords our children the opportunity where they begin to, again, express what their communicative and their leadership uh, skills are, presentation skills are. This is the room and um, very interactive in terms of this environment. As we go to the upper, primary school classroom in the next slide. As you see here, this is not a sit down room for teachers. This is a room that pulls teachers out of the seats interactively with children in a cooperative classroom environment. And uh, as you see, again, emphasis is on much of the traditional furniture that you currently have is going to be removed. This is about, again, engaging our children in developing this, their individual personalized learning interests, but also how they take that personalized learning and transfer it into a cooperative and group learning experience. That's what we want for our children as we, de as we move toward developing their knowledge and their skills. And it is about new skill development uh, in these classroom and 
in these particular learning environments. In this next slide, I'm very probably much excited about this room, the 3D studio, 27th, cent 27th century. No, that's where I shop. 21st century learning is very much about this type of room. You may hear in uh, other places, they may talk about a fabrication lab or a 3D studio as we see here. Um, we're calling it the maker's room. I like to call it the innovation room. This is where children produce something. Our children must move from a position of consumer mindset to a producer mindset. And yes, entrepreneurship is very much a part, not just of this room, but of their learning experience. They must see themselves as producers and owners, creators of the jobs and the, the careers and skills and jobs that are not even there yet. But how perceptive will teachers be in observing what the talents and the strengths of our students are to capture this? So the 3D studio is very much a visionary room of the school learning experience for the future. When we look at the last slide, well, hey, we're not without play. And so, hey, we want outdoor play. Yeah, developing is fine motor skills, but importantly, the gross motor skills. And while our children don't climb trees like we used to, they'll have the opportunity of doing climbing walls as you see there at their age, developing their gross motor skills. So it's going to be somewhat of an interactive environment and it's not just for this playground. We'll have a, uh, gymnasiums that are also designed for the purposes of what our children are expected to do in terms of their own physical, mental, spiritual development. So just be reflective and think in terms of five, 10 years from now, what will the Bermudian child look like coming out of this learning experience based upon the effective teaching done by many of our quality teachers in our education system today? We want a vision, a new vision for learning, and we believe we have a powerful vision for learning in this depiction, and we welcome your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Simmons, for sharing the vision for learning and the types of learning spaces that will be needed in order to implement that vision. I think one of the things that I would underscore at this time is that, you know, we cannot prepare students for the future with the current teaching and learning models and the current buildings that have been built for an education system and jobs of the past. And so our vision is looking at getting children ready for their futures uh, and to enable them to be successful no matter which school they attend uh, on the island. Thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Simmons. You're welcome. I want to share a bit about the concept of a parish primary school. Now, the first of all, highly effective schools have high levels of parent and community engagement. You heard uh, Dr. Simmons talk about the fact that we want our children to go outside of the building, outside of the learning spaces as well, to be able to connect their learning with the real world, to apply their learning outside of the classroom. And that's going to be a very critical component moving forward. And so the concept of the parish primary school aligns with our vision of using the surrounding community and the organizations to assist with the learning of our children. So when we consider um, the research, there's a growing body of research that makes it abundantly clear that support from those beyond the gates and beyond the walls of the classroom is really essential in preparing children for the 21st century. So we are envisioning schools as the hub of their parish. 
And so the surrounding community, the parents, the neighborhood will rally around the schools, focus and channel their energy and their efforts into helping the school to be successful. We envision community partners helping to, uh, to be a part of those learning experiences and programs. Well, some of you will say, well, that happens now. And my response was, would be that it may happen now, but it happens sporadically. We may have uh, community partners who may give a donation once off or maybe once a year to a school. We may have community partners who come into the school once per month, or uh, they may come in once per term. But we are talking about setting up an infrastructure that would integrate the surrounding organizations into the learning experiences and the operations of the school, a very powerful model, one that would, we would want to have sustained, one which would see our partners just as a normal part of what happens with education in our schools. We would want them to share their professional expertise and resources and services for students, also for staff, but additionally for parents. So the model we are looking at brings all of the, the school family and the parish family together, uh, working to help the school, working to help the children to be successful. So it's a very powerful model. We want communities to take ownership for the success of the children. We want those individuals in the parish to say, you know what, we are the ones who are gonna commit to ensuring that our children are successful. And we want to rally every organization, every parent in the community, in the neighborhood to make the schools and what is taking place in the schools a priority. That is not happening at this point, but our vision is looking at putting systems and infrastructure in place to make that happen for our children. Um, schools are expected to prepare students for a very complex and rapidly changing world. In addition to teaching just the, you know, the regular subjects, they are expected to develop children who are information and media literate, uh, who are critical thinkers and problem solvers, uh, children who have excellent communication skills, who are great team players. They have to teach children how to become uh, aware of the environment around them, to how, how to be civically responsible and other uh, help them to acquire other lifelong learning skills. The model that we are looking at and what we want for our children and we know that they need in order to be able to be successful and to compete locally and globally requires a parish. Schools cannot do it alone. We are also going to improve the structure of the Bermuda public school system. Legislative changes will be brought forward and they will include the phasing out of middle schools. We will establish a senior level signature school with pathways for our children. I'm excited for the children. I'm also excited for the teachers. Uh, we will look at establishing a signature school for children who have exceptionalities and special needs and to ensure that this facility and the type of teaching and learning that takes place there will meet the needs of our children, better meet the needs of our children. We are looking to, the legislation will also establish an alternative education signature school. At present, we have a program. We are looking at a school, an alternative signature school that will afford our children to have any uh, special needs, any emotional needs, any behavioral needs, and any other needs met at this particular signature school. Additionally, the legislation will uh, bring about a change from a three-tier system, primary, middle, and senior, to a two-tier system, primary and senior signature school. This will result in primary schools going from P1 to P8. The vision also includes having preschools on the same site 
or in the same building as our primary schools. We will reduce the number of transitions that children have to make. With this new vision and this model, when a child enters school at the preschool level, the next transition will be at the, to the signature school. And so we understand the research around the negative impact of the number of transitions. This revised structure will not only enable us to meet better meet the needs of children and to improve what we offer, we will also reduce the number of transitions. We also recognize that we need fewer primary schools. Why? Well, we re the trend data shows that there are a decreasing number of children enrolling in our schools. There's also a decline in the birth rate and the trend data indicates that there will continue to be a decline. And there are some projections around the numbers in the consultation document. We've already shared with you that the old facilities or buildings cannot support the new vision for learning. When we think about the fact that we are going to have additional students coming into the schools, two additional year levels at the primary level, additional staff, you saw the types of learning spaces that we need to accommodate the vision for learning. We're going to expand the curriculum offerings. That means expansion of buildings and the development of specialized rooms. Our current facilities cannot accommodate the new vision. There really is a need for equity across all of our primary schools. Right now, we uh, have our staff and so we can have, you know, we have our 18 primary schools and so we will take a counselor and we will, you know, split the counselor amongst two schools, etc. And so we want to shift to a model where we actually look at the demographics of each school and then we assign the resources based on the needs of the children in that particular school or each particular school. We also recognize that right now we have funding for education and that funding is spread across 18 schools. If we shift to the fewer schools, 10 schools that we are proposing, we can better distribute the resources, we can better utilize the resources, financial and other resources, and set our schools up for even greater success. So Ms. Morris, I'm going to turn it back to you so that our participants have an opportunity to share their comments or ask their questions. Fabulous. All righty. Okay, so um, I've received a few questions in advance of the meeting. So um, just as a reminder, for those who are in the Zoom, you can put your questions in the chat. Um, if you're on Facebook, you can put your questions in the comments. If you are watching from home, you can call on 478-3301. Um, and I will happily read out your questions. So the first question we have is, how will there be enough space in one school to compensate for three schools worth of children? What sizes will the classes be? Uh, Ms. Morris, I can answer that question. Uh, first of all, I'd like to draw every uh, the participants attention to some of the data uh, in the document found on page 28, which are the projections for the number of students in each parish. Now, the model that we are proposing, which is research-based, looks at our parish primary schools. What we're proposing is up to 300 students. The numbers that are projected based on page 28 uh, will enable us to accommodate the projected number of students in each of the parishes. So how will the schools have enough space? Um, when we consider the vision for learning and what we want for our children, we will have to develop school buildings. We are looking at expanding. We are looking at specialized classrooms for our children. And so that will enable us to accommodate the projected numbers. And in terms of the number of students per class, we are proposing a ratio of one teacher to 15 students. 
Okay. Um, this question asks, there is no explanation for how the high quality of education at St. George's Prep is going to be maintained and spread to all schools. Well, I first of all, I'd like to um, thank the, the participant for that question. And what we are looking at, and I, I made a comment at the bill at the beginning, we recognize that all children have gifts and talents. And we have a responsibility to shift and to put measures in place to enable all children to show and demonstrate that they can be successful. So we are looking at a model for success that goes across all of our schools, not just one or two of our schools. We are looking to ensure that um, we have that our vision, the vision for learning will be personalized and it will bring it, it will actually meet the needs of all of our children. I think the other thing that I would like to put on the table is that we can make a distinction between a school's performance and individual students' performance. And so many of the comments that are made about high performing schools are based very often on just the Cambridge results. But I want everyone to understand that there are additional contributors to school and student performance. And so there are many other aspects that we have to look at when we look at student performance in addition to any assessment like Cambridge. There are children across all of our schools and you know who are doing well, but there are children in our schools, across our schools, all of our schools who are not doing as well or who are not experiencing the level of success that we want. Our goal moving forward, we're saying it's no longer acceptable for just pockets of children to be excelling. We want every child to be successful and to be um, achieving in our high quality, you know, in a high quality situation in the schools that we propose moving forward. So again, it is not about one school uh, doing well with a particular set of results. It's that's just one small piece. We're talking about other factors that can be attributed to success for schools. And we're talking about just not some children in some schools doing well. We're talking about all, we want all children in all schools to do well uh, moving forward. That's what we are proposing. And that's why we want to transform and we want to make the change for our children. Okay. Um, thank you for that, Commissioner. Um, I have a next question that says, what is the thought process behind the, the selections of schools in which you have proposed to close? Rather than propose to close down a high performance school, i.e. St. George's Prep, why not build onto a school that already has strong community ties? Now, I know that the, the consultation document does address that on page 30 and onwards, um, and the scoring was on page 41 of the consultation document. But just for our, um, our viewers, can you speak to that a bit, please? Is our permanent secretary online? I am online. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Um, I was actually just uh, reflecting on that question as it relates to the thought process behind the schools. First of all, um, as Ms. Morris indicated, on page 34 and 35, it maps out very clearly the study factors that were used in terms of the um, deciding which schools would be proposed. Now, we want to make it very clear that all 18 schools were actually scored against these study factors. And so when we turn to page 35 of the document, there were four broad categories, existing building conditions, land and property conditions, safety and health and transportation. But what actually steered the scoring was the fact of keeping in mind and at the forefront that what was the best 
location or the best site that could actually accommodate the vision that we have for our primary schools in terms of the 21st learning vision. And it was that basis that these study factors were developed and the sites were chosen. Thank you. Okay, um, Permanent Secretary, this might be a little bit of a follow up, a bit of a follow up on that question. Who created the grading protocol for the schools and how were the scores reached? Excellent. Okay, so I am going to refer participants again um, to our, our consultation document. On page 34 at the very bottom, we point out the fact that there was a team, a location strategy team comprised primarily of expert professionals. And these professionals acquire or they have specialized knowledge of buildings and or they currently work on the government primary school buildings and they work on these buildings on a daily basis. So they have an intimate knowledge of, of the um, our primary school buildings. And if we shift over to page 35 of the document, using that high level of expertise that the professionals had, their expertise, their knowledge, these four broad categories, which I identified or stated earlier, they were actually mapped out. And then they even went further to create 19 study factors. And these study factors were then used to score against each of the primary schools. And so it was critically important for the professionals that served on this team that the um, process developed was a fair process. It was important that it was thorough and that it was sound. And so we followed that with their given advice. Um, 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 Ms. Morris, I was just wondering if I could jump in. I just wanted to add something to that. Sure. Um, and, um, and for everyone on the call, I do apologize for the technical issues I had earlier and I was unable to give my welcome. But I do want everyone to understand that school reform does not just, um, does, does not just center around our parish, um, our parish proposal. There are more factors to our, to our school reform. Those factors being the development of an education authority, which is looking at the governance structure on how schools operate within, within Bermuda, as well as the Learning First Initiative, which is doing the uh, examination of how teaching is occurring throughout our system, recognizing what, what is working, what isn't working, and developing a plan for moving forward with a revised curriculum, as well as uh, how the how the learning will occur within the within the school system, and so I understand some of the questions that are coming, um, uh, and more, more like and most um, centered around uh, the St. George's Prep um, school system, and we are committed to looking at what is working within our system, what is not working within our system, and pulling together a system that is equitable across the board that provides our students with all of the necessary resources and opportunities to excel. And so when the, this part of the parish primary school proposal is looking at how can we take our buildings to match what it is that we want our children to, to learn as well. And so what we're dealing with now is talking about that process. And what we've recognized is that in order for us to, to have our buildings catch up to the um, catch up to what it is that we want our children to learn and what our children to be experienced within our system, we have to do make some, we have to make some changes at that level as well. And so it's not it's not just about um, uh, building a building that has um, that that is newer than the building that already exists and putting children in there. It's about creating an entire system holistically from the bottom up that not only provides our children with the necessary resources and facilities in order to learn from a 21st century learning perspective, but also revamping how education occurs within our buildings, taking what we're doing good now, taking what we might not be doing as good now coming up with a scheme to move forward, taking, looking at the governance structures that we have that currently exist within our school system and, and what's working and what's not working and coming up with a system that is, um, provides all of our schools with the same level of expertise, the same level of uh, resources and the same level of success. Thanks, um, thanks uh, Ms. Morris. Not a problem, Minister. Um, 
Let's go to our next question. Oops. Um, oops. Given our current buildings are old and the vision is every Paris school being, is the vision that every Paris school be rebuilt from the ground up. And when is all of this projected to be completed? Um, P.S. I believe that's a question for you. Actually, the, the minister can't answer this question, but I, I can immediately say that um, the proposal at hand is that our current buildings will be renovated, refurbished, and upgraded accordingly. And so the question was, will all buildings be was it built from the ground? Yes. No, they won't. Now, what the proposal does propose for Devonshire is a new build for Devonshire, for Devonshire Parish. But the remainder of the schools will be looked at, assessed by the professionals, and determined in terms of what renovations will be needed, what refurbishments will be needed, and what upgrades will be needed in order to align with the vision that we have for our schools. The minister may be, want to add about the timelines. Uh, th thank you, P.S., for answering that question. In, in terms of timelines and where we are with this, what we are um, going through is an exercise now to help us make decisions that will, that will, that will have impacts on whatever the official timelines are. So at this point, it is not possible for us to actually name dates and times for anyone to say, this is when this will start, this is when this will be kick in, this is when this part for, um, will phase in. We are working through this methodically and questions answered on the process that we are now will lead to what types of questions need to be answered in the next process. And we will continue along that line and length until we get to a point where we're able to say, this is the final blueprint plan moving forward. And this was how things will work. And that who will be shared as we move forward. We, this is not a process um, that um, a, a lot of stuff will be done behind closed doors and, and we'll just come out and say, hey, here we are. We will keep our, our key stakeholders involved. We'll keep our stakeholders updated on exactly how we're moving forward. So everyone will, will see it and will be able to envision as we move forward. There will, there, we promise that there will be no surprises in, in what it is that we're doing. This is one of the reasons why we're having these um, these types of sessions is because we want everyone to come ask the questions that, that is on your mind and burning because we, 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 we are here to answer those questions. And if we don't have the answer to those questions, we'll give you rationales why those answers are not applicable at the moment. But as we continue through this uh, processes that we're doing now, certain decisions that are being made based on the answers we get now will then have impact on questions as we move forward. Thank you, uh, Ms. Morris. Thank you, Minister. Now, just for a reminder for everyone, um, you can submit questions on www.menti.com. The code is 3413518. Again, the code for Menti is 3413518. And you can also call in on 478-3301 or 505-8701. George Simons from Facebook has asked, said that we need a technical school for trades in electric vehicle technicians, masons, carpentry, plumbers, and et cetera. We also need a performing art school. Um, can we get a comment on that from, uh, I believe Dr. Simmons, that's you? Given that this presentation speaks more to the status of our primary schools, I think the call of ox is a relevant question that goes to our signature schools and uh, what is being proposed is in line with our signature schools. So that is a part of a future presentation as we begin, to, as we talk about our signature schools uh, at the uh, upper levels, but certainly at the primary levels there will be what we would call uh, exploratory types of learning experiences uh, in those particular 
modalities or fields of learning. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Um, we have a hand up in our in our chat. Uh, Mr. Denbrook, would you like to answer your ask your question? Yeah, sure. Good evening. Sorry, hold on, my kid. Um, so, thank you for this evening. The, uh, Sorry, can you just speak up a little bit? It's a little hard to hear you. So thank you for this evening, um, and also for the um, uh, the consultation. Can he type it? We cannot hear. I cannot hear the question either. Let's give Mr. Denbrook a moment to type his question um, and I will ask another one. Um, says the government plan is to increase the working population. How does this match up with your projection of declining enrollment? Ms. Morris, we have a responsibility to ensure, first of all, the success of all students, and then to prepare our students for the workforce of the future. Um, and so our focus or the focus of schools will be equipping students to take the jobs that will be available. So our role is to prepare them so that they are well equipped to take the jobs that will be existing in their future and to succeed at those jobs. Awesome. Uh, Ms. Morris, I also wanna add in the chat, I see that our um, data team has posted the link to the consultative document because I see some of the questions that are coming. And <clears throat> what I do urge is, every, is, is people to click on that link. And um, if you can turn to page 25 where there is a high level summary of, uh, of the proposal. I mean, the, the entire booklet has, the entire booklet has some really, really good information, but um, page 25 does have a very high level summary of what our current state is and what the future state is, um, is, is the future state that we want to be. And um, I, I encourage people to take a look at that particular page as well as we uh, move along. Okay. Um... I don't see Mr. Dunbrook's question up as yet. Um, oh, here it is. Um, thank you for the consultation document. It provides sufficient context as to the rationale of this change and how it is one piece of a holistic puzzle, which includes a complete pedagogic shift for the entire system. It does indeed. Um, so my next question is, what is the plan for transportation and after school care for those whose children will be making a longer commute, as this will not be a simple commute for St. David's children? Um, I believe that is a question for the commissioner. Yes, so it's the question around transportation for students. Our vision is to have school buses for children because you've heard us all, you know, for the for transporting them to and from school, the, having the school buses are going to be critical because we look at having a morning program and after school co-curricular program that is very rigorous, which means that we expect children to be at school longer than, um, you know, uh, at school, sorry, for perhaps an hour, hour and a half after the end of the instructional day. We also need those to take students outside of the school to um, so that they have experiences to apply their learning. So we will, part of, of what we have to do is really to assess the transportation needs and to develop a plan that will meet the needs of students in each parish. I hope that helps. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we have a comment here. It says, I'm oh, sorry, it's a question, not a, a comment and a question. High quality education is a result of the teaching and leadership within it, not the buildings and facilities. The fact remains that St. George's Prep has high quality teaching and leadership. How can we ensure that this remains and is not diluted by the amalgamation of, by amalgamating three schools into one? 
believe that's a question for the commissioner. Yes. High quality teaching, high quality leadership, the provision of resources, the actual facility, the involvement of parents, the support of the community, and other factors contribute to the success of schools. What we are proposing is to bring together the research around teaching and learning. And we have shared that vision about personalizing the learning, about connecting it with the, um, the talents and the skills and the passions of children. So that's going to play a particular part. The building and the facility will be an enabling factor for the teaching and the learning. So we can't get away from changing um, the buildings because the vision for what we want to do, teaching and learning will be very different from what it looks like now. How children will move about, how children will be organized in a building will be very different from what we, uh, what we have now. And our current structures will not be able to accommodate. So yes, high quality teaching, I agree, absolutely. High quality leadership, absolutely. But there are so many other factors. So it's more complex than what uh, we are discussing here. There are so many factors that contribute to the success of a school. There are schools across the island that have success with, with many of the factors but we want schools across the island to have success with all of the factors. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I see in the chat, um, Koshay Millet, you have your hand up. You have a Would you like to ask your question? Hi, yes, good evening all, thank you. I have placed several in the chat, but um, I will ask this question. And it's actually a, a runoff from the question that was asked just now. Um, the, the human resources, as I see it, is the major piece here. If at the end of the day, we can build what we want to build, we can implement whatever systems we want to implement. But if the teachers are not retooled in a way that's going to align with what is happening, then um, it's not going to work. Part of the problem that I've seen, that as I see it in the past, is that 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 piece has not necessarily always taken place. The implementation has fallen down. We, we produce glossy pr presentations and we do all of these things, but ultimately it's the teachers that have to implement it. So if the implementing piece, p implementation piece is not clearly worked out, um, it will probably mean that some of the teachers are not in a position to continue in the system it will mean a, a large retooling of what it is that they currently have. So how is that to factor into what is gonna take place? That's my first question. And then I have many, but my second question is for high performance schools that we have in the East, we have two of the, the top performance schools in the East. And as Ms. Bridges pointed out, that's based on schools. I don't know what else the um, we're basing all of our results on, but ultimately, St. David's Primary, which is also a high performing school, in my view, it's high performing because it is small. The classes are small, class sizes are small, the school overall is small. So the sense of community that we're talking about producing, I, I don't see how that's going to happen with 300 children, even if this one teacher per 15 students, it's, it's just the environment overall is just bigger, which leads to a less sense of community. So how are we going to foster that in something that's so large for children that are so little? Because that's the other piece. Remember, when they started Cedar Bridge and Barclay and, and the new version of Barclay, those are bigger children. These are small children. So those are kind of my two comments and questions, but definitely the human resources, as I see it, is, is, is going to be the biggest piece to all of this. It doesn't matter what we build. And if we don't retool the teachers, I think we need to start with that in my humble opinion. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, we have started with that. We have a program called Learning First. And so we recognize, and I think they will put something in the link to Learning First. Um, you talked about the importance of the human resources and you referenced the teachers retooling. Teachers, school leaders, 
Department of Education leaders, professional and uh, development that is sustained and integrated into the operations of the system is going to be imperative. So I certainly agree with you there, because if we want to make the shift to the type of vision for learning that we want for our children, and we know it is based on the current research, it requires us to help our teachers to acquire the additional skills and competencies, the leaders, the education um, officers, uh, technical officers to acquire the additional skills. So I do concur. You've made a statement that uh, high performing schools are, well, you, you were saying that you think one of the factors contributing to the high performance of St. David's is its size. Uh, we want you to know that the research, uh, and you, you hit on it with your first statement, it is actually the quality of instruction along with the resources being available. And when children have high needs, we have the uh, specialist staff who are in place to provide the interventions to help the children to meet those uh, standards. You talked about also a model or a concern around having uh, up to 300 children in, um, you know, in a school. And we're talking for children going from preschool to age 12 or 13. Um, we have private schools on the island who have children uh, from ages from preschool up until 18. So the model that we're proposing for primary is not uh, something that's out of the ordinary. There are jurisdictions around the world that will have this model. Uh, we've used the research in terms of determining uh, the potential number for children, uh, and we've allowed that to guide us. So, so I'm ho I hope that helps. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I actually had a question here that said, may you cite the research that states larger schools are better for younger children, but I believe that your answer just now um, spoke to the fact that that's not what we think. And you that's not what we said. That's exactly. not what we're saying. And again, if you look at some of the private schools, they have children, they have uh, foundation programs, and they go right up to their senior level, and they are all on the same site. Indeed. So I have a question here on what is the savings from shutting down some of the schools and how is that compared to the cost of the upgrades? Um, I believe that might be a question for the minister. And thank you, Ms. Morris. Um, one thing that, um, and again, I do apologize for those who are just logging on for me missing my um, opening comments due to technical issues. Um, we're not looking at this from the perspective of saving money because that, that is not the ultimate goal here. The ultimate goal here is to produce a system that is equitable across the board. What we are looking to do is take the resources that we now extend through 18, um, 18 buildings to now fund uh, and to run 10 buildings. And so when we start talking about cost savings and, and things along those lines, and I know some people do wanna, re, do wanna kind of swear, swear towards that, we're talking about taking the existing resources that we have and piling them into education. They, we're not talking about uh, doing this because we want to save money. We're doing this because we want to produce a better system than what we have now. Thank you, Minister. Um, I see in the chat, um, Ms. Alexandra Greenslade, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask your question? Sorry, I, I wrote it in the chat. Oh. oh, I didn't realize my hand was up. Okay. <laughs> no, but I, I, I can read it. So I was saying, will principals have the power to hire their staff? Um, this is something that worked really well for prep. Can, can I take that one, Ms. Morris? You sure can, Minister. Again, again, we, we spoke earlier about the um, looking at what works well, what works uh, that uh, what doesn't work well within our system. Uh, that's what Learning First is looking into, as well as the, the, per the people that are looking into the creation of the education authority. Now, one of the things is um, a recurring theme that we do have here about um, uh, PrEP, and PrEP is one of our aided schools within our system. Um, there are several other aided schools within our system. 
And some things work well that, that are happening to be working well at, at PrEP, some things are not working well at, at, at our aided school. We want, we want all of our things to work well. And so if that is something, and the, um, the group that is looking at the education authority, one of their remits is to talk to the aided schools and, and see what they're doing um, and, and, and how it is that they're operating because that could be something that can take into account of how we move forward with our entire system. And so some of the questions that you are at, some of the questions that are being asked, while they are very, very good questions, and we welcome them and we really need them, they are going to be utilized and determining what is the final uh, decision moving forward. Um, but the question about will principals have the power to hire their staff is uh, one of those questions that will probably, that will most likely come down to what the governance of the system looks like under the um, authority. And it's something that I know that uh, Ms. Morris can record and take because she is part of, she is, um, she does help that group that is looking into that um, with, with um, some of the, some of the um, technical stuff that they're looking at. And so that is a good question that can be passed on to, um, passed on to the uh, authority group for them to look at. Thank you, Minister. Um, so just before I ask, ask the next, quest, next question, um, but we have the, we've collected the emails of persons who have submitted questions. So if your email, if your question has not been answered, we will do our best to respond to you um, by email because again, this is a re, um, an iterative process. We want to, to your information. We want your questions and we want you to have your, have your answers, okay? So our next question um, is from Mr. Cahill. Um, he's said that neighborhoods with those schools are less desirable for homeowners and tenants. How can we justify move, removing a school from St. David's, which will drop property prices, rental values, and affect local community services, such as after school care? And it will also increase congestion in St. George's. Um, I, I would like to take that one, um, Ms. Morris, if um, no one else will. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that, that is a very interesting question and one that I think would require more quantitative da data in order to answer. Um, Bermuda being 21 square miles has a school within a mile of just about everywhere. And even with the proposed plan, that ratio of schools to distance away from um, the, the dwellings is still not going to be reduced. And so I, I, I'd be curious to see uh, the data behind such, such a question because what we're discussing now, certainly I don't believe that we have enough information in front of us to, to make, first of all, make that assumption or and answer, the, answer that particular question. So I do apologize for that. Um, I, I, just don't, I just don't see it, but it is an, in, it, but as we said, uh, with, the, with this consultation, all questions are valid questions and all questions will be looked at and, and, and analyzed as we move forward with the final decision. And that's something that we'll have to um, get some more quanti qualitative data in order for us to really, really answer that question. May I add to that? Um, I, I would encourage Mr. Cahill to perhaps make a submission and just to share with us more in-depth thought around that question or those thoughts. I think, I think that's something that we could actually take into consideration where we make decisions um, if, if we know that additional information. So I would encourage him to, to make a submission just so that we are provided with more information from that, that pair of lenses. Thank you. And one, one thing I did wanna add um, and this, is, this has to do with some of these other questions that have come through. And we, you've heard us talk about Learning First, the Learning First program, which is looking into, uh, looking into the, what, needs, what is happening within our schools and what we need to revamp and what sort of training needs to be put in place um, to get our teachers um, skilled up. Um, it was put in the chat, in the chat that the um, website for that is www.learningfirstbda.com. I encourage people to visit the website, sign up for their um, newsletter because they send out information. Current and in, in soon they will be start doing um, prototyping 
as a way, which means that they'll be testing some of the, um, the, the, the things that they've come up with, and they'll be looking for people from the public to participate in that. We're looking for all people from all walks of life. So this is an opportunity for everyone on this call to actually play a factor in what the new school system will look like, what the new learning techniques will look like, what teachers will be um, getting their professional development around. Um, additionally, on Monday, every two weeks, we host a radio show called Education Matters. This Monday coming up, um, Learning First will be featured on Education Matters to talk about the program and the prototyping and how to sign up for some of these things. And so um, I encourage you to visit the website, I encourage you to sign up, and I encourage you to tune in on Monday to learn a little bit more about Learning First. This has been a great question answer session. Um, I am very pleased with the number of questions that have been coming through um, at this moment. Um, we're going to take a pause. We're going to take a poll and then go on to the next part of our presentation because we want to make sure that everything um, that that we need to share with you is shared. But we will have another question and answer session. So. Um, Right now on, your, on the screen, there should be a question that says, do you agree with the introduction of parish primary schools with one primary school per parish and two in Pembroke? Your options are yes, no, or not sure. Um, if you please submit your responses now, that would be greatly appreciated. And then after this, we're going to continue with the presentation. And like I said, we will definitely return to your questions after, um, after the second part of the presentation. But right now we're just asking for you to respond to this poll question, and then we will move on to the second part of our presentation. Okay, so it looks like, oh, here there are the results. And the results are that we have 21% saying yes, they agree, 42% saying no, and 38% saying not sure. Okay, at this time, we, I will turn the floor over again to the commissioner to continue our presentation. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Part two of the presentation will focus on the specific proposals for parish schools. I will share with you the factors that were used to decide which primary school loca locations should be refurbished or rebuilt. And then I will drill down and discuss and share information on the specific parish primary schools. We are proposing 21st century learning facilities because that is aligned with our vision for learning for children moving forward. If you look on the left-hand side of your screen, you will see the four broad areas for the study factors that we considered for our proposed school locations. The existing building conditions, land and property conditions, safety and health as it relates to the facilities and the building and transportation. Some of the sub factors that we considered from those four areas were included the age of each of the 18 buildings, the electrical and plumbing conditions of those buildings, 
the boundary and zoning restrictions. And that, that was a critical factor for us because when we consider the vision and what it requires uh, in terms of teaching and learning and what that teaching and learning model will require in terms of a learning facility, there has to be capacity for expansion. So the boundary and the zoning restrictions were considered Given the model of the parish primary school and the extent to which we foresee the community, the surrounding community and neighborhood uh, integrated into the teaching and learning and operations of the school, we also factored in the surrounding community services. Additionally, we looked at uh, the proximity of the school to the main road. We looked at transport and site access, which we believe was also important. Uh, we looked at the, the uh, proximity of the school to the bus routes and whether there was potential for traffic congestion. The safety and accessibility were considered important as well. And we pulled the data from the score report when we were scoring all 18 schools. We looked, uh, the team of uh, technical officers looked at the environmental building conditions. And then these last two study factors were critical was their expansion capacity. When we think about the fact that we're going to add two additional years, we're going to have additional students, additional staff, we're going to have additional courses that are offered and specialist rooms, is there the potential for expansion? And then once there is expansion, would there still be sufficient greenfield space to accommodate an outdoor recreational area for a preschool, lower primary, as well as upper primary, in addition to accommodating a very robust sports program with space for spect uh, spectators. So those were the study factors that were considered uh, for our proposed school locations. After considering the study factors and scoring them, we are proposing parish primary schools, 10 redesigned, refurbished, or one newly built parish primary school, one primary school per parish with two in Pembroke Parish, and continuing with enrollment by Zoom. So we presently have our 18 schools spread across the parishes. And we're proposing to shift to 10, one per parish, two in Pembroke. I would now like to drill down and share the specific proposals with you, starting with the Western Zone. The Western Zone currently has West End Primary and Somerset Primary School. Somerset Primary is the proposed parish school. It received the higher score of the two schools. It has a large available acreage. It has the capacity for development expansion and to accommodate up to 300 students plus the additional staff. Somerset Primary also has a large playing field and sufficient outdoor space. In addition, it has a preschool on site. Therefore, we would propose that we close West End and that we have Somerset Primary as the parish school for Sands Parish. When we move to Southampton Parish, we have Heron Bay Primary, Port Royal Primary, and Delton E. Tucker. Delton E. Tucker is the recommended parish primary school. It received the highest score. In fact, it outscored the two other primary schools in the area for land and property. It has the acreage for development and capacity for expansion, which is critical for the vision for learning moving forward. The Southampton Preschool is adjacent to Delton E. Tucker. So therefore we propose to close Port Royal and Heron Bay Primary and to have Delton E. Tucker as the parish primary school for Southampton. 
Purvis is the only school in its parish. And so Purvis will, as part of what we're proposing, is the development of that particular site. Let's move to the central zone. And we will start with Paget. In Paget, we have Paget Primary and we have Gilbert Institute. Paget Primary is the recommended parish primary school. It scored almost double in the weighted scores for land and property and conditions than Gilbert Institute. For those of you who may be familiar with Paget Primary, there is a significant portion of land behind the school that would allow for expansion and development. Therefore, it is proposed to close Gilbert Institute and to have Paget Primary as the parish school for Paget. In Pembroke, we have Victor Scott, we have Northlands Primary and West Pembroke. We propose to actually have two primary schools in Pembroke Parish. And we propose Victor Scott and we propose West Pembroke as the parish schools because they receive the highest scores. Both schools have acreage and land potential for expansion. Victor Scott already has the preschool on site, and West Pembroke does have the potential for a preschool. Northlands has boundary restrictions and limited potential for expansion. Therefore, we propose to close Northlands Primary and to have Pem uh, Victor Scott and to have West Pembroke as the parish schools for Pembroke. Now, when we get to Devonshire, we are considering uh, the schools in Devonshire as part of a larger vision for education moving forward. And so at this juncture, we're proposing to close Elliott Primary and to close Prospect Primary and to have a new build in Devonshire Parish. We want to have expanded facilities to meet the needs of children who require alternatives and who require uh, services for exceptionalities. So as it relates to Prospect, we propose to close it as a primary school and repurpose it as a school for uh, accept an exceptionality signature school to serve children who attend Dame and to serve as a new location for the K. Margaret Carter Center. And in time to provide additional special education services to students with exceptionalities from across the island. As it relates to Elliott Primary, we propose to close Elliott Primary School and repurpose it as an alternative education signature school to serve students with social, emotional, and behavioral needs and other alternative needs. And again, catering to children from across the island. When we get to the Eastern zone, Francis Patton and Harrington Sound are the only schools in their respective parishes. And so we now move to St. George's Parish. St. George's Parish has three public primary schools, East End Primary, St. George's Preparatory, and St. David's Primary. East End Primary is the recommended primary school because it scored the highest total score of the three schools. East End scored the highest for the categories of land and property conditions and safety and health. The East End site has a large available acreage and the potential for development expansion to accommodate 300 students and additional staff. The adjoining land has sufficient outdoor space to facilitate greenfield space for recreational areas and a robust physical education and sports program. The site at East End is also in close proximity to St. George's Preschool. 
St. David's Primary cannot accommodate 300 students plus the additional staff. There is no land to expand St. David's Primary unless Lord's Oval at St. David's Cricket Club is reclaimed by the government of Bermuda for use for the school. However, we are not proposing that. St. David's Primary School also scored the lowest regarding safety and accessibility. St. George's Preparatory, sorry, cannot accommodate 300 students plus the staff. It should also be noted that St. George's Preparatory School buildings are held in trust and owned by the St. George's Board of Governors. It is not owned by government. The intent is to refurbish primary schools so that they are updated facilities fit for purpose. The government prefers to invest public funds in schools and property that are government owned so that the benefits are wholly public. I want to zoom in on the specific study factors on the screen. The existing land area, boundaries, any development restrictions, greenfield space and expansion capacity. The existing land area that is usable and has zoning is land that can be used for development. East and primary scored the highest for this study factor. Expansion capability is the ability to develop the school building in alignment with the vision for learning while adhering to the building code. This land being within the ownership of the government. This also includes safe, adequate access to the site and adequate facilities for pedestrian and vehicular movement. East End Primary scored the highest for this study factor. Boundaries and any development restrictions was also an important factor because they determine the setback requirements for development of a property. East End Primary scored the highest for this study factor. Greenfield space is an important factor. We need to ensure that there is indeed sufficient undeveloped land for recreational spaces for pre, lower and upper primary students and a robust sports and PE program. East End Primary scored the highest for this study factor. Therefore, we proposed East End as the parish primary school for St. George's, and we propose to close St. David's Primary and St. George's Preparatory. These proposed changes will impact students and staff when we consider all of the uh, proposal for parish primary schools. And we do understand that this is a very sensitive matter. Students at schools that are recommended for closure would have to transfer to other schools and some students would even have to travel further and we do recognize that. Um, as it relates to staff, their roles will look differently uh, as it, with, the, with respect to the new vision for learning. But however, there will be new roles that are gonna be created. And I do want to underscore that the government and the ministry is committed to undertaking a fair and transparent process on how to best staff schools within the proposed new structure for education. When we consider the schools that are being, or the locations that are being recommended for the parish schools, there were some key features that they had in common. The facilities can be expanded and developed to accommodate the new vision for learning. There is potential to accommodate up to 300 students and the additional staff to also accommodate an on-site preschool for with 30 students along with the staff. And then in after that expansion and development, lots of green space for the outdoor recreational uh, program, as well as a robust sports and uh, physical education program. Ms. Morris, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Commissioner. We've had quite a few questions come in while we while you were presenting. Mm -hmm. 
and I want to jump right in. Um, so the first one is, the proposed new school facilities look lovely, but the success of our education lies with the human resources within. How will principals and teachers be assigned to the new schools and what steps are being taken to improve teacher performance? I believe this is a question for you, Commissioner. Yes, just jotting down so I can make sure I capture. Um, just can you read the question again for me, please? It was relating to the facilities and human resources. Yes. How will they be assigned? Yes, how will principals and teachers be assigned to the new school? And what steps are being taken to improve teacher performance? So in response to the first push, uh, part of the question in terms of how will staff be assigned, I at the end of the presentation, I talked about our commitment to a very fair and transparent process as it relates to staffing schools. I can say at this point, that there will be, that that's part of the plan once a decision is made to actually have a plan that will address how uh, staff are actually assigned to schools. I want to underscore as well that we will engage our leaders, we will engage our staff and have their input into what uh, that process will look like. As it relates to the second part about improving performance, we look to improve performance, but also we're looking to actually require additional qualifications and certifications and expectations around ongoing professional development. Earlier, you heard reference to the Learning First program. There's also a commitment to ongoing professional development. We improve performance by allowing, uh, by uh, providing teachers with opportunities to hone, refine, and deepen their skills, but it has to be ongoing. And so we propose a model that integrates the ongoing professional development of our teachers, of our leaders, of the Department of Education staff as well, uh, with the aim of improving the performance of our staff. Thank you, Commissioner. This next question will be for the minister. Um, we've had this question in several different forms, um, but I'm going to, and unsurprisingly, it's about finances. So you're talking about a budget to spread out evenly. The budget is inadequate at best now for supplies, equipment, et cetera. PTAs are trying to fill that gap where government should. So please explain how that budget is split now because it's clearly not the, on the resources in the school and how do you think it will be better? The problem is funding, not number of schools. And actually, um, that, that is a very topical question. I wanna thank the person for that. As, we talk, as I talked about earlier, um, we, have, we, we, are, we have a limited budget. We don't have a finite budget that we can just um, continue, continue, continue to raise. And what we've recognized is the mere fact that we are funding 18 locations when, uh, as the proposal states, we can be funding 10 locations with the same amount of money, imagine the, the, imagine the ability to provide the resources that are needed through 10 locations using what we're trying, what we're doing to fit 18 locations in. I think it's a synth. I think that could be a, a very interesting math question because as, as the commissioner has pointed out throughout her uh, presentation, one of the things that we recognize is the inequity and the inequity comes from the fact that we are trying to fund 18 locations and with, with uh, in a system that, that realistically could uh, handle 10 locations. Um, and then we met whatever we are spending on those 18 will be spent on those 10. And then we would see some of these um, lingering issues. Now, when, when I think about, when I think about this uh, and, and we have to, we have to, you know, we, 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 are, we encourage people to think forward because we want them to stop thinking about what our school system used to be like um, and think about what we need for 21st century. But we also have to look backwards and see why we ended up with what it is that we have and it's 18 locations. Um, in the mid 80s, when, when, when people said that our, when, and you, you heard the arguments that, um, or the, um, the arguments that our system was really working well back in the mid 80s. Back in the mid '80s, we had nearly 8,000 students. We needed those 18. We needed those 18 buildings. Right now, in our in, right now, our entire system hosts um, just under 4,400 4, students. That is almost a 50% decline. But we are still 
clinging on. We, we still find ourselves clinging on to the vestiges of what we needed in the past. We need to look at what we need now. And what we need now is a more equitable system that utilizes the resources that we have better than what we than, than what we can, what, what they are being utilized for now. And this is why when we looked at the revamp of education and we looked at what needed to happen, not only from what happens inside the classroom, not what happens outside the classroom, what happens in the community. And in this particular case, we're talking about what happens with our particular buildings. We have to look at this and be bold and be understanding that we're not doing this because one, we want to just, because we just want to. We've taken a holistic look at what education is. The team has worked diligently in the background and came up with what I think is a very good documentation that actually documents every single thing what, of why we're doing what it is that we are proposing to do. Um, again, no decisions have been made. And if we are, if, if the final decision is to move along these lines, we will see some of these actual things that we're talking about almost instantly start to improve. We'll have more fun. We'll have funding for the schools that need the funding. We'll have the resources for the schools that need the resources. We'll be able to meet our children where they're at and provide the things that they need in order to become successful in their own country. These are some of the things that we're looking at. So when, so to answer that particular question, I don't think it's about the, I don't think it's about throwing money at the problem. It's about looking at what we have and doing it better than what we have been doing. Thank you, Minister. Okay, um, my next question um, will come from the Zoom. Uh, Ms. Rogers, I see your hand up. Would you like to ask your question? Hi, yes, I actually just have a two part question. With regards to the Zoom, and you guys said that you took into consideration you know, safety and things like that. Was the opening of the St. Regis considered when you looked at the planning for East End as that's, I assume, gonna create a ton of traffic just around the corner from the school. And also St. David's and St. George's have traditionally never been the same community, even though they're under the same parish. Like what realistically did you guys plan look like for trying to combine those two into one community when they've never traditionally been one community? And I think I think it's an actual and that is a very, very good question. And um, when we're looking at and from my perspective, and I know I'm going to let the um, commissioner actually um, uh, chime in here as well. Um, Bermuda is one community. The island is a community and we need to start looking. I know we do have our various differences based on, on locations we've been pro, we've been brought up, but this education is not something that I view as territorial. And something that we, we should look at, okay, if it, it, as long as we're doing good over here, we're not worrying about what's happening over there. This is an island-wide issue that we need to solve. This is, a, this is not a PLP thing. This is not an OBA thing. This is not a West, West End thing. This is not an East End thing. This is not a Central thing. This is a Bermuda thing that we're trying to solve. And it works better when all of us are working together and not, looking at, uh, and not, and not necessarily looking at ways for us to be different from each other but ways how we can assist all of us to reach the potential that we need to reach. I'm sorry, and, and Commissioner, I know you you look like you wanted to um, chime in on that as well. Yes, Minister, thank you. We appreciate the question. I wanted to share that um, once a decision is made, one aspect of the planning will be an assessment of the, you know, the, the traffic routes, traffic congestion, and all of that, not just for St. George's Parish, but every parish as well. And then in terms of how do you bring uh, two different communities within one parish, um, part of the uh, planning will also involve what we call uh, a transition plan. And it has to factor in, and not only is it bringing together uh, different communities, but it's bringing together children from different schools, et cetera. So all of that will be factored into a transition plan. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I see Mr. Kenton Trot, you have your hand up and your video on. I appreciate that because we have asked persons to have their video on while they're um, on the Zoom. So please, Mr. Trot, ask your question. Good evening, everybody. Um, 
it's a pleasure to see Miss Rich as a part of this team because we go way back. So thank you, you very Mr. much. Drop. Good to see you. <laughs> you as well. Um, I have actually a three-part question. It's similar to the question um, raised just now. Um, the first one being, um, when you have a two-parent household, as many homes are, um, it's easy enough when, for example, both families live in St. George's or both families, maybe one lives in St. George's and one lives in Hamilton Parish. However, um, is there going to be some facility or some situation where if a parent or a child, I should say, has a multiple parent household that they live with, one might live in Somerset and one might live in St. George's. So how at the present moment, obviously, it's <clears throat> a situation where it's difficult to manage that. However, going forward, is there going to be some facilities to say, OK, cool, how can we best serve the needs of that individual? Um, the next part of my question is similar to the St. David's question. Um, obviously, I'm born and raised in St. David's. And one of the things that I used to look forward to as a child was being able to ride my pedal bike to school with my friends. I would go to my neighbors, we would stop. I had three friends, I'll stop at his house, stop at the next house, stop at the next house, and we would ride to school. Now, I mean, I know we're trying to build a sense of community and encourage exercise. Now, it, it's, I, I don't think any child is gonna ride from St. David's to St. George's every day to school. So I just wanna consider that as a factor as building the community and stuff like that, because as these individual that spoke before said, St. David's and St. George's, yes, we're close, we're trying to force the relationships, but they're two very different communities. Um, so just that in consideration, because most of the other schools, if you live in that parish, you will probably be able to, you know, go to school because the parish is a bit smaller, but St. David's and St. George's is a bit of a, a gap. Um, also going back to the transportation, I think other people raised it. I know that currently, you know, recently there were some issues with transportation um, for the buses and the minibus and everybody knows about that saga, will there be some consideration to have a specific bus assigned to each school if we're, you know, trying to budget and trying to raise, determine how finances are going to be spent if we're able to save, as the minister said, in some areas, will there be considerations to saying, okay, cool, here is a bus specifically for St. David's students, I'm um, sorry, St. George's um, East End students that will transport everybody from the East End and be able to take them to school. So that's just another consideration. So consideration and question, I guess, is a three-part thing. So thank you very much for this forum. I um, really appreciate the openness and transparency of this and looking forward to it. I've always been a proponent of public school and I will always be a proponent of public school. Thank you for that. Same here. Um, let me go back to your first question and it was about if a student is um, with a parent who lives, maybe the parents live in different parishes and how will we be able to accommodate the student? Yeah, more, more so specifically, because um, I know a lot of parents nowadays is like joint custody where, you know, they spend a week with the father, a week with the mother, vice versa. It's, we have to be, you know, honest about the situation in Bermuda, not everybody's always together. So, you know, I know of a lot of situations where a lot of questions were asked saying, okay, well, if one lives here, one lives here, how is that best gonna work? We know how it works now, but in some cases it's not really working because I know of a situation where somebody has to go from work all the way to St. George's to drop the school and vice versa. Somebody has to go from Hamilton Parish all the way to Southampton to drop a student. So, you know, just how best can we go forward? Because obviously it's individual circumstances, but I guess just building it into the future plans or future picture. Absolutely. And I think they both tie and it also ties with the trans, all of that is the transportation piece. We really do envision, um, having our own buses for the Bermuda public school system. Um, and I, you know, we're looking at having those buses transport children to school from their respective areas, um, because we're looking at having early morning programs for those parents who would like to sign their children up. And we're looking at those programs to be just totally different from anything we've seen. We just want them to be first class, world class. They and students would have their instructional, you know, day. But we also want those buses available to take those children outside of the school, outside of the gates, outside of the walls on an ongoing basis, not just on the odd occasion, which happens now, but as part of their actual program when the school day ends in terms of instruction, we are looking to implement a very robust co-curricular program so that we're, you know, the students have their talents and their passions. And so we want them to be able to engage in those activities after school, which means students will be at school a little later than they're used to. And we would have to ensure that there are buses to take them home. And so we would have buses to do that. Um, so that's what we're proposing. So if a student who is with a parent in this parish and goes to the school in this parish is fine, 
but if they're living, you know, this, the following week, they're in another parish, we propose a system that will enable us to meet the needs of children. Because we really, we want, we want children to be able to, we want a reliable system that will get them to school on time so that they're not missing out on learning. They'll be able to participate in these awesome activities after school as well and not have to worry about, okay, how am I getting home? We want to have a, a bus service for the education system that will do that. So I hope that helps answer your questions. Thank you. And we'll, yes, the yes, panel by, so I was much. thinking about, you know, the co-curricular program might have a, a cycling, you know, a cycling program so they can get some paddling, paddling in there. Okay, thank you so much for your responses. You're I welcome. appreciate it. Thank okay, you. Then. Awesome, thank you, Commissioner. Um, our next question, a uh, bit of future casting, what is going to happen if Bermuda's children if Bermuda's population increases tremendously, will we open the old schools back up again? I guess that's a question for the minister. Well, you know, I, I would love to see um, our, our school, our, our population increase. Um, the data just doesn't support that. It, it, um, it doesn't support um, us having a, a you know, a humongous influx of children into our system. We're talking literally tens of thousands of, of persons would have to come here with, with, you know, for, for there to be uh, that sort of influ influence. Our, our birth rate and, 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 with, and with the recently uh, released um, data, data on um, Bermuda, Bermuda, the, um, and the, I know the PS could help me out here. It's the, um, the, Digest of statistics. That, that's what it is. The most recent one shows even, even more, <laughs> even more dire straits. Our birth rate has, has declined even more than it has so over the last few years. Um, I think what people don't recognize, well, um, I think it's worth mentioning, our birth rate has been declining since the 70s here in Bermuda. We've just seen a steady decline of people having children. And that has that was also during a time when Bermuda's population was bursting at the seams as well. And so we've just seen a constant decline. And um, when, and it also I think it's worth mentioning, the data also shows that the decline that we see in our public schools is mirrored in the decline that we've seen in Roman in our private schools. So, so it, is, it is about a declining birth rate. And so it's not a matter of, it's, it's not so much a matter of uh, flight to our private schools uh, from, with our children. Yes, the private school population has increased, but when we look at the stats in terms of enrollment, they are seeing a steady decline as well based on our birth rate. And so it'll have to be something um, incredible for our birth rate to, uh, to, to go up much further than it was. And, and I do encourage, um, as we look at the, um, the document, it's very a good high quality document that's been put together. And we look at the enrollment um, statistics within our document yeah. and the, potent, uh, the projected enrollments. Um, and we are talking about uh, St. George's. We are, we are currently, uh, a total number of students in St. George's right now in between all three schools stands at 179. In seven years, that's predicted to be at 156. Yeah. And so, so the, the data bears out exactly what it is that we're proposing. However, we also know that as we are doing with this consultative process, we have to consult and we have to listen to the various ideas that are coming. Um, I think um, we've had a, we've heard some really good things that, that we, um, we need to consider as we move forward and, um, and make our way towards the final decision. But the data, um, and just to summarize what, um, that question, the data doesn't support that there will be a massive increase um, at any time soon uh, moving forward. So, and, and so we, uh, but we do plan for that. The, the data that we do have shows that most of our schools at this point will be, and, and the commissioner could correct me, will be about 75% full. So there is capacity to, to fill to accommodate the additional to accommodate activity. if there is this massive increase yes. there's station for that yes. um, as we move forward. Thank you, Minister. Now and that's this page twenty-eight of the document. Twenty-eight, yes, mm -hmm. and, and the predictions in seven years show almost um, not one parish having more than three hundred students. Most of them under most of them around the 150, 180. Right. Within okay. seven years. Okay, so we have just under five minutes to go. Um, so I'm gonna try and get in as many questions. So I'm gonna ask our technical officers to make their, their responses as brief as possible. Um, so our uh, next- Ms. Morris, Ms. Morris, before you ask that one question, um, 
I, I do see one that's popped up in the chat that I do, I do want to address. Um, it says here, may someone answer the question about funding and is this supposed to happen within two years? Um, there is no timeline that has been addressed. There we will not, uh, that, um, we don't foresee any of this happening within two years. So I just want to dispel that myth. Um, the government is committed to funding this. We've already um, got put, brought on consultants. We've already been talking about various funding models moving forward for this. However, the, the, the answer to the cost and how this is going to look cannot be ascertained now until the decisions that we're trying to make now have been made because those will, as I mentioned earlier, those decisions will lead to the answers to further decisions. And then once we get to the end of that decision-making process and we start looking at a blueprint of what needs to be done in order for us to bring our system up to where it needs to be, that's when we will start talking about funding. Thank you, Minister. Okay, so this next question comes from Facebook. Um, please ask what will happen to the special needs children that are currently in the school system? Will government add another school for special needs children? Thank you uh, for your question. There will be, I'm excited about this because there will be additional opportunities for our special needs children. So we're looking at having uh, a school for, uh, a signature school, sorry, that's an alternative. And so there will be options and opportunities for students, special needs students who would like to have an alternative there. There are special needs students who will, may still benefit from an experience in the regular primary school or who may, uh, whose parents may say, you know what, I want them in the signature school for the exceptionality, which will spend, you know, which will um, exist for children from across the island. So there will definitely be options. And the other thing that I want to underscore here, as we consider those models, which will come into place through legislation and what they will look like and what will be offered for children, we will be in, you know, coming to get input from our parents, from our educators, from the community. And I think it's going to be a very exciting process. We recognize that we have to do a better job for all students, and we have to definitely do a better job for children who have special needs. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, have one more question, I think, before our time is up. Um, have the views of the community partners been sought as they seem to play a key role to, to, of the success of the parish primary schools? I didn't hear the first part of the question, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, have the views of the community partners been sought as they seem to play a key role of the success of the parish primary schools? I believe that's a question for the minister. The, um, with, with our process, with, it is open and transparent. Anyone can send in a consultative document. Anyone can, um, can join in our meetings. Anyone can, can send in um, queries that they do have. We have reached out in this particular um, proposal that we've come up with is not, the, it's, it's about 18 months of, um, of studies that have gone into this to come to where we are to, to where we are now. We have always been reaching out to uh, across the Bermuda's community for suggestions. Um, we, we've held uh, various, we've held meetings in the past where we've reached out and we even, um, I can even look at the um, Learning First uh, program where we, and where we reached out to the community for, for persons and, and everyone that's working with Learning First are community members that have shown interest in in improving our education system and they make up the teams that are going out and doing this critical work that, 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 we, are, that we are aiming to do. And so we've always, been a, we've always been a system that reaches out and we want people to volunteer, we want people to want to be involved in, in, in what we're doing. So at the end of the day, we are creating a system by Bermudians for Bermudians. All I have to do is go back to plan 2022 and understand the massive amount of community input that was given to that plan. This part is now putting, putting those things that came out of plan 2022 into action. And so 
you know, what, what we're talking about now is not something that um, we, we've just, this, that we've just tried to pull together. This is something that has been years in the making and it's something that, is, that has had community input as we move forward. And, we, and as we are having these messages at these sessions today, we're still having community input as we move forward. Fabulous. Now, at this time, we have reached the witching hour, so to speak. It is 8.01. Um, before I give the floor back to the minister, I just want to um, give the community an opportunity to learn more about the school reform. Um, just making you aware that on Monday, um, February 8th at 5.30, PM will be um, Education Matters. It is a radio show that we, um, we discuss bi monthly opportunities to speak about education. And this Monday's episode will be talking about the Learning First Initiative. Um, so if you want to learn more about the about Learning First, what they will be doing with for our students, for our teachers, um, please do turn in. Um, you'll be able to, again, ask questions, um, find out more about the entire school reform process, um, the, the transition away from middle schools, the um, implementation of an education authority, the um, introduction of parish primary schools are all a part of school of education reform. Then I want to thank everyone for um, coming out tonight. And I know the minister wants to address everyone, especially as he was unable to um, do so at the beginning due to technical um, circumstances. So minister, the floor is yours. Okay, um, just one thing. Wasn't there another poll? Did yes, we, we do. Oh, have yes. Oh, gosh. Do uh, sorry. Yes. Yes. yes, so yes. We, we, we're going to get to that slide. I just want to ask our participants just to reflect along with us um, if we don't make the change, because we're really looking forward and we're, we're looking at the future of children at this point and what we want for them and we want better for them. And we know there have been longstanding national issues about education. So if we don't make the change, then you know we just don't address those, the, the children pay the price. You know, our children are not going to get the high quality educational experience they deserve. We know we have to change. We know we have to do better for our children. The cost of doing nothing is really too high for our children. We want to share just very briefly with you about the consultation process. We'll take the poll and then the minister will give the final thanks. Good, good evening. Thank you, Mrs. Richards, and, and thank you, everyone. I just want to speak briefly about the consultation uh, process. Um, we are listening, collecting, and capturing all of the consultation responses, um, including the comments in the meetings via email, as well as through the consultation response form. So we are, uh, the minister as well as uh, the consultation team, are looking at the responses as they come in. Um, and at the end of the consultation, every single comment, viewpoint, question, um, will be considered and analyzed as part of the consultation uh, decision-making um, process. So we'll look at the consultation uh, responses from different perspectives, by school, by stakeholder group, um, certainly by theme. And then and we also certainly are looking at all of the alternative proposals that people are, um, that are, are, are putting, uh, putting, putting to us. Uh, there have been some questions about the timing in terms of the decision making, and we're committed to providing um, a response in terms of the outcome of the consultation by the end of the current school year, although a decision may be made sooner. It really just depends on the um, extent of the and the number of the, of the consultation um, submission. So we definitely encourage people to um, um, send any, any additional questions to the consultation email at consultation at moed.bm. And it will also, um, is also recorded on, or email address is also on a later slide. We are collecting also the questions and the chat comments that were provided in Zoom. So I know there was um, some, some, uh, some questions that people haven't, um, that we haven't been able to, to reach everybody, um, but certainly that we are capturing them and we'll find a way to get information um, to you. So thank you again, and I'll turn it back to Mrs. Richards. Thank you so much. We are actually going to move to our poll questions. Back to you, Ms. Morris. 
Okay, so our last poll question um, is just to, basically just to give us a bit of feedback on the presentation this evening. So the first question is, were there enough opportunities to share your views and ask questions during the meeting? Yes, no, or not sure. And how would you rate this meeting? Excellent, good, or needs improvement? So we'll give you a minute to um, answer that, those two poll questions, and then the minister will close us out. All right, so we have our results. Were there enough opportunities to share, um, share views and ask questions? 36% said yes, 56% no, and 8% said not sure. Um, how would you rate the meeting? 16% excellent, 40% said good, and 44% said needs improvement. So we will take these views on. Um, we thank you for your time. And um, we did have a lot of questions and I'm glad that we did. That means that you are interested and vested in your community, which is a beautiful thing. No one will complain about that. So minister, over to you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Morris. Uh, again, thank you, all of the participants. Thank you, the Department of Education staff and the Ministry of Education staff. And uh, more importantly, thank you, parents, uh, community, um, persons who are interested in what it is that we're doing. Um, I did not get to greet, greet you due to my technical difficulties, so I'm not going to go over that. Um, there was, uh, there was um, Ms. Morris, if I do take some latitude, a question in the chat that I do want to answer because it spoke about um, including the opposition in this. And I will uh, let you, I, will, I do want people to know that we have held meetings with the opposition to share uh, the vision. Um, um, and, and we look forward to um, discussing, I look forward to discussing with my counterpart, um, Senator Ben Smith, um, some of the things that we've been talking about tonight. Uh, we have had some um, opposition members tune in to these meetings as well, as well as um, um, government um, members. And so I, I can rest assure you that the, um, that the political um, persons are engaged in this and they're um, looking at this as well. Another part of that question had to do with if um, governments change. That is one of the reasons of looking at the education authority um, to provide a to provide a avenue for consistency with our education system, regardless of who sits in this particular seat that I sit in now. And so that is something that is a major um, a major initiative of my of myself that I do want to see uh, consistency across the board. Um, we have to, and I understand how some of us are looking at this and we're looking at it from the fact of, um, you know, there's some historical legacies that we're trying to overcome here. And those historical legacies as, um, and we own that, that the Department of Education, the Ministry of Education, you know, have, um, have commissioned reports, done exercises and such, not the follow through not, may not have been um, as adequate as it has been, in, as it should have been. We are looking at this as something that needs to be done, has to be done. And this is why we are going along the pathway that we uh, find ourselves going along. We're being very, very deliberate as we move forward. There, we do not want to overpromise and underdeliver on this. We are being very, very methodical on how this is moving forward and the ways it will move forward so it can be implemented and implemented with fidelity. You know, um, Although we don't have answers to all the questions that have been answered, we will endeavor to seek, seek answers to them. And we appreciate all of the questions that have been submitted because they will be used as Ms. McEwen said, in our, in our, in, in, it, it, they will weigh into our final decisions as we move forward. So, but with that, I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I, I, I appreciate you and I appreciate your um, interest in our public school system. I ask you to continue to be engaged um, you probably heard a lot more information than most of you had even thought was actually happening there. Learning First um, Bermuda, I encourage you to visit their website, get involved if they ask. Let's look out for the social media posts and the like, because we are looking for Bermudians to help us create this system for our Bermudian children. 
um, be, be on the lookout for anything else that's come out, read through our consultative documents, submit your, your proposals. I know we talk about these questions here and we talk about the um, email, but the um, proposal document also has some very specific questions that are asked that can help um, guide you in making your submissions. Um, and, so, and so we encourage you to do that as well. Um, everyone, good night. Please continue to be safe. Please continue um, to look out for our little island as um, we go through this worldwide pandemic. And uh, I wish you all a very um, good weekend, rest of, rest of the week and, and into the weekend. And I look forward to perhaps even seeing you on alternative meetings as we continue to have these meetings throughout the month of February and ending in March. Uh, so with that, thank you, Ms. Morris. I wish everyone good night.